Hello everyone, I'm Chancellor Gary May. I'm so glad you could join us for our last plugged in event of 2021. Today, we'll focus on a truly fascinating subject, the global culture and science of one of the world's most historic and popular beverages. That's right, I'm talking tea. The UC Davis Global Tea Initiative for the Study of Tea Culture and Science has been devoted to advancing the understanding of tea and tea culture since its founding in 2015. Informed by a global perspective, the initiative's interdisciplinary approach uses a combination of research and teaching to bring attention to this vital worldwide industry. The Global Tea Initiative is a perfect example of the unique and exciting things happening here at UC Davis. We're building on a tradition of excellence. That's clear from our most recent rankings. Forbes named UC Davis number four among public universities in the nation for, quote, the most outstanding education to the broadest range of students at the most affordable price. And we retained our number five spot in the 2022 Wall Street Journal Times Higher Education College rankings. Excellence is also a tradition that the Global Tea Initiative is carrying forward as the first and only group dedicated to promoting research and teaching in tea culture and science. Bringing attention to a multi-billion dollar global industry, the initiative provides the opportunity for faculty to set their own research agendas and collaborate with members of the tea industry. Today's speakers will share aspects of this research and they'll introduce us to the UC Davis Global Tea Initiative Professional Tea Program. Now I invite you to pour a cup, get comfortable, and enjoy today's discussion. Good afternoon, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Estella Atequana, and I am the Dean of the College of Letters and Science, the largest of UC Davis's colleges and schools. Since my appointment last June, I have had the pleasure of witnessing firsthand UC Davis's commitment to providing a world-class education while fostering a world of creativity and teaching unto itself. I am absolutely delighted to be with you today to discuss one of our most unique ventures, the Global Tea Initiative. During today's event, we will be discussing how the initiative builds on UC Davis history of tea research and the way we are expecting, we are expanding collaborations with industry partners, university researchers, and creating new knowledge about tea. After we've heard from our speakers, I will open it up to you all for a question and answer session. For those of you who have already submitted your questions before the webinar, thank you very much. For those of you who didn't have the time to submit your questions, don't worry. You will have the opportunity to submit questions throughout the event. To submit a question, please type your question in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question for a particular speaker, please be sure to mention their name in your question. Lastly, after the Q&A, there'll be a short poll that we should that we would like to ask you to fill out. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the founding director of the Global Tea Initiative and Professor of Art History, Dr. Catherine Burnett. It's a, uh, we're delighted to be with you today and share a little bit about uh, the Global Tea Initiative for the Study of Tea Culture and Science, or as we call it, GTI. Um, GTI is devoted to advancing the understanding of tea, Camellia sinensis, and things consumed as tea, such as chamomile and mint, through research and teaching across the disciplines and from a global perspective. GTI is unique in the world because it brings attention to tea through research in culture and society, science and health. Because UC Davis is the University of California's most comprehensive of its 10 campuses, its four colleges offer about 100 majors and as many grad programs, and we have six professional schools. GTI can study tea from almost any discipline and any method. Simply put, no one else can do for this advancement of knowledge of tea. Um, any, nobody else can do this uh, better than UC Davis. Unlike tea institutes in established tea growing regions, GTI is tea neutral, that is, Research agendas are not set by national demands. Faculty are free to set our own research agendas. With the campus's extraordinary breadth of expertise and GTI's holistic mission, GTI is the first and only entity to promote research and teaching on tea culture and science. <clears throat> 
With significant support from GTI's Tea Advisory Committee, composed of national and international tea industry leaders, GTI is becoming the Global Tea Institute. Although only at the beginning of its seventh year, GTI is already recognized by campus administrators as another jewel in UC Davis's crown. GTI membership is also unique in that it includes not only faculty, but also librarians and staff and students. GTI's mission is to foster the understanding of tea through evidence-based knowledge with a global perspective, promoting research on tea from anywhere in the world, in any discipline, with any methodology. With the goal of being the top resource worldwide for tea information, we are spurring global research, teaching and collaborations, driving innovation and insight in the tea industry and academia, and establishing a global tea education program for students and the industry. I'm happy to share that tea industry leaders have told me that they'll hire anyone that GTI has taught. As we build our vision for GTI, we have big dreams that include having our own building with tea rooms and gardens, a dedicated sensory theater, a model processing facility, and with a growing GTI collection of art, material, culture, and books, also build an exhibition hall to narrate the many stories of tea. GTI actively fosters knowledge through annual colloquia and on a more ad hoc basis, lectures and workshops. These activities address the needs of the campus, industry, and general public. Our next major event will be held on January 13th, <clears throat> 2022 by Zoom. It will be an exploration of Camellia sinensis and wellness teas called Tea and Beyond, Bridging Science and Culture, Time and Space. Registration will open soon on our website. I hope you will join us. Meanwhile, please save the date. GTI colloquia attract large audiences from campus, regional, national, and international bases. Last year, our Zoom activities drew about 1,000 engaged people from around the world. Videos of the colloquia are being archived on our website and into the campus library collection. Although tea is the most consumed beverage in the world after water, it is really astounding that serious research on tea has largely fallen under the radar. GTI is changing this. To promote research and teaching, we are developing formal partnerships with top tier international institutes with established tea research programs, including in Taiwan, Japan, and Kenya. These partnerships ensure the global reach of the initiative and the leveraging of each campus's expertise for mutual benefit. Also, GTI is a co-PI on a USDA multi-campus grant, establishing partnership and building infrastructure for production, harvesting, processing, and marketing of US grown tea. Our, our invited application is in process. For several years, I have been conversing with the University of Washington Press about a tea studies book series with the GTI in Premature. We are now preparing a book proposal with papers addressing the theme of last year's colloquium. The preface will be written by New York Times bestselling novelist and last year's keynote speaker, Lisa C., author of The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. We hope this proposal passes muster and will form the inaugural book of the new UWP series. As for teaching, we are developing global tea culture and science curricula. For five years running, we've been offering the GTI team taught first year seminar on global tea culture and science, a course that immediately fills to its cap maximum. Working with UC Davis Continuing Ed, we are creating the new industry requested extramural UC Davis GTI professional tea program. You'll be hearing more about that from Jim Brown in a moment. With our international university partners, we are collaborating on interactive seminars on special topics. These activities are grounding our efforts to develop the curriculum for a new minor and grad level designated emphasis in global tea culture and science at UC Davis. Meanwhile, independent tea study majors, MFAs and PhDs are in process across the disciplines. Visiting scholars and students from around the world are eager to study tea at UC Davis and are already drawn here because of GTI. I'm also happy to report that GTI is already having an impact on campus campus and at other institutions nationally and internationally. When our students learned about GTI, they immediately petitioned to form the officially recognized UC Davis Global Tea Club. Due to popular requests from other national and international campuses, we are creating a tea club in a box to help others create their own club chapters. Similarly, in response to frequent requests from non-UC Davis researchers to join GTI, we founded the International Society for Global Tea Scholars. This organization is open to any scholar or expert wishing to advance research and teaching on tea. 
UC Davis's renowned Robert Mondavi Institute for Wine and Food Science is studying GTI to uh, figure out ways to incorporate cultural studies into its, its storied program. Well, I'd love to go on, but it's time to move on. So permit me now to introduce my wonderful GTI colleague, Professor of Chemistry and the Food Chemistry Graduate Group, Dr. Jacqueline Gervais Haig. Thank you all. Thank you, Catherine. It's such a pleasure to be here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to tell you about the research that we're doing here at UC Davis. It's um, very much dependent upon uh, previous researchers not only at UC Davis, but actually even in the United States. But I'd like to start just by telling a little bit about how we got into this business of tea. Um, I'm in the Department of Chemistry and for the most part of my career, I've been working on pharmaceutical compounds. And the, the UC Davis has enjoyed a very rich relationship with researchers in Taiwan and uh, that has also impacted my research tremendously. And at one point, I had an opportunity uh, to visit a tea plantation uh, or tea garden in Taiwan. And you can see a picture of that here in this slide. And I was immediately struck by the similarities of the tea garden to the Napa Valley wine um, region. And I asked my host, why aren't we growing tea in California? And he just laughed at me because he said, well, it's only the water, the soil, the humidity, and all these other factors. And he taught me this idea of how the environment, every, all these multiple factors in the environment impact uh, specific crops. And tea is very special. The tea in Taiwan takes very special water high purity water, it takes certain pHs of soil to grow. And he started teaching me about that. But at the same time, I couldn't be more struck by the similarities with wine. Even the active components in tea are very similar to wine. And so I just became so excited about this opportunity in research and reached out to my students to see if any would be interested in joining in a new research project where we looked at the chemistry of wine. And as they began to join me, I'd like to share with you a, a video that they created that pretty much sums up the, the kinds of questions we're asking in our laboratory. my students uh, definition of terroir. And uh, anybody who's enjoyed a pot of tea, I think can relate to all those questions that we're asking. But in our group, we're chemists. And so we really pay attention to the chemical components that are in tea. And our journey in this area led us to the understanding that true tea, as it is often referred to, comes from a single species of plant, Camellia sinensis. And that species of plant can be made into all the different types of tea, white, green, oolong, black. So they aren't different tea plants necessarily, but rather the way that the leaves are processed that determines uh, the type of tea that emerges from the plant. And on the next slide, I'd like to tell you just a little bit what we learned about 
the history of the growth in uh, of tea worldwide. As most people know, it is most, uh, most of the tea in the world is grown in China and in India. And as we started exploring this area, we learned that actually India's tea growing enterprise started um, really in full force in the 1800s. And lo and behold, the same thing was occurring here. Very similar studies were occurring here in the United States, particularly in South Carolina. And a number of different tea varieties had been brought into the United States. And a very talented chemist, Dr. Charles Shepard, had done a number of studies in trying to establish tea as a crop in the South. And he showed that tea could grow very well in the United States and actually even um, process tea using methods very similar to the methods that were being developed in India. Uh, and showed that it actually was a very viable crop. However, the, the key fe feature that I think led to diminished um, production of tea was labor that it was pretty much concluded that the labor, it would be difficult for the United States even then to um, compete with the labor market of China and India. So it wasn't until mid, uh, on the next slide, we can see how things progress. And it wasn't until like the mid 20th century in the 1960s, that tea growing uh, began in earnest in California. And those were studies that were led by Dr. Uh, Charles Ingridson here at UC Davis. And using the, the plant stock from South Carolina, he, uh, he studied a number of different varieties, about 72 different varieties and showed that some grew uh, with very high yields in California, yields that could match um, the yields of other major producing countries. They uh, had to water the plants, you know, give a lot of extra water to the plants, adjust the soil pHs and things such as this. But it was very clear from those studies that tea could be grown in California. And in fact, he had, grown, had test plots throughout California in the Central Valley um, mostly in the Central Valley region. But today we even have uh, farms that are growing in the Central Coast region, as well as the Central Valley region and several counties throughout California. Next slide, please. As we've continued our studies, really, um, really following in the footsteps of Professor Ingridson, and bringing in the concept, the 21st century concept of the fact that microbes that are present in the soil can impact a plant's um, viability and the chemical profile of the plant. And so that's what we've been really focusing our efforts on is growing uh, these cultivars that uh, do so well in California using uh, chemical methods by which we can follow the metabolism of important components that impart health and sensory attributes to tea. Many of these microbes are found within the plant, in the roots of the plant, and they produce um, important chemicals that are known to be desirable for high quality tea. So, this is a, a very large team effort. And on the next slide, I can uh, kind of show you the, the, uh, the uh, process that we're following. So because we, it, it's actually only as of 2017, could we begin to genotype the plants because that's when the, geno, uh, the genome for T was first reported reported in the literature. So working with the USDA, we're able to now genotype all the varieties of tea that are growing in California. From that genotype, we can also uh, do what's called metagenomic studies and determine what microbes might be associated with 
the various teas growing in these different regions. And then we can actually um, process and grow, identify and isolate those microbes and independently learn about their chemistries. And then we study their chemistry in the context of their association with the plant. All the while looking for preferred uh, chemical profiles that are known. There are actually many known chemical profiles that uh, are associated with high quality tea and also the health effects of tea. And using this, we can also grow the tea in new environments that are sustainable. We can grow them indoors and we can uh, monitor all the nutrients that go into the plant so that we can uh, adjust the chemical profile of the tea that is processed from the plant. So working together with a, with a large team, we're actually working um, internationally still, but also throughout the United States with researchers in Louisiana, Mississippi, um, South Carolina, Alabama, and Georgia, and um, also in uh, Oregon. So there's a large uh, repertoire of farmers and scientists in the United States that are working on this important problem with the goal of bringing a 21st century tea growing and production enterprise to the United States. I'd be very happy to answer any questions about this um, at the end of our talk today. At this point, I'm very happy to introduce my colleague, Chair of Professional Studies, Dr. Jim Brown. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I joined uh, GTI several years into their um, establishment. I was brought in because of my day job, which is at the uh, Department Division of Continuing and Professional Education. Um, my, we leverage campus strengths and train industry, lifelong learners, um, new skills that they desperately need um, for the program. Um, in particular, um, I run the winemaking certificate, which runs about 250 students a year through our program, online program. And we've been doing that for quite a long time. Uh, we have the master brewers program that also trains master brewers in an academically rigorous way. Um, and we were trying to emulate, um, I made a presentation to the advisory board. Uh, the advisory board is made up of some really powerfully engaged industry leaders. Um, they uh, were really impressed with the idea of being able to train the industry. They, uh, they hire sales reps that don't understand the history and the, and the distribution. They, uh, they hire scientists that don't understand the culture that goes behind it. So what they were looking for is something that could teach, uses a, um, a a training for their, their staff for, and for people that are trying to get into the industry over the entire aspects of all of what the programs um, are like. There's a couple of people, Elliot Jordan at Mighty Leaf. Um, some of you don't know, but Pete's Coffee has a very strong um, wine um, tea program and Elliot runs that program and is um, a, a guiding light in the program. Helen Hume of Finley's Tea. Um, which um, brought in a different aspect and a different culture and was a very strong proponent of some of the value added components. We had Bhavan Shah, a tea importer whose family runs, um, has been working in the tea industry for quite a long time. But that really goes to the gamut from Paul Harney at Harney and Sons, Rona Tyson, which does um, at Ito N. There was a lot of collaborative effort in trying to develop a curriculum that was going to be worthwhile to the industry. Um, we also brought in other people that weren't part of the uh, direct uh, um, involved in tea companies, but had expertise in quite a few different aspects. We brought in Jeff Fuchs, who is, if you've never seen him speak, um, he's an explorer um, and a vibrant um, lecturer. Uh, talking about his um, treks through the Himalayan trade routes and his uh, lifelong um, learning for tea. Uh, Catherine Bennett, which you've already heard from, has been speaking in the program, bringing her expertise with the art and history. Uh, Nigel Mellican um, is a 
scientist. He was a uh, scientist for several decades um, at Unilever and has one of went to the reach, um, has some of the richest knowledge in tea plants and tea growing. Uh, but also we have tasting from Kevin Gascoigne and Christian Miller brought in the brand and marketing and um, how you segment yourself from the rest of the competition. So it was a well-rounded cast of both the industry, academics, and uh, industry leaders. Um, and they came up with this, um, this long um, program that we ran that had all different um, topics from the tea drinking history, sustainability and organic growth, distribution and channeling, value added, and we ended up with tea and health. So it really did take it from the beginning all the way through the nuts and bolts to the uh, to wrap it all up and why we drink tea to begin with. Um, and that, this is kind of a stale list, so I'll just break it down into subgroups um, to highlight some of the topics that we talked about. Um, tea drinking and consumption, history of tea. Um, if you look at the different places in the world that drink a lot of tea, it really is different in every society. They have their own culture, whether it's Turkish tea, Japanese, um, England, or all of the other empire um, countries that came from it, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. Um, they have, some places have absorbed the tea, um, high tea effect, which is where um, three-year-olds, 30-year-olds, and 90-year-olds get together and have, can share a tea party in the highest um, effect. Uh, but even the iced tea culture of the U.S. has a big effect on, on tea consumption in the U.S. and how we picture tea. Um, tea is grown in a lot of different countries all around the world. And we've already seen that the tea is, um, can be where it's grown, can affect the flavor, how it's processed, can affect the final product. Um, how you even pluck it, whether you do a single pluck, a fine pluck, or a coarse pluck, you get different tea products. And all of those have different um, effects. In reality, Nepal and Darjeeling, uh, sorry about that, right next to each other, are have completely different types of tea just by the environment they're growing in. And then um, if they're processed differently, you get different effects. We also had Marcus Wolf, who is one of the um, eminent tea tasters. It's called cupping, where you taste and spit quite a lot of tea in a very short amount of time to get the sense of the quality. And this isn't just for grading for price, but it also for blending to make sure that your, qu your quality of tea is the same throughout. When you think of tea as a, um, a seasonal product, you want to have your your what comes in the tea bag year after year to taste the same. And blenders bring that in, graders bring it in. There's a lot of expertise that's involved, and he has um, provided an incredible resource in our for the GTI in how to taste um, teas for quality and and um, trading. We also spent a lot of time on sustainability, organic, but also the the social justice, labor um, issues. Um, we have not just the organic and the fair trade organizations that drive a lot of the change in the tea industry, but things so silly as the certified elephant friendly tea, which isn't really important unless you have elephants that are living next to the tea uh, fields and are being poisoned by some of the runoffs. Um, and those are affecting change in the environment. Um, we have in certain areas of the tea world, uh, tea producing countries, the, the social justice has been lagging behind. We've had un, um, poor personal protective equipment when they're doing pesticide and, um, and herbicide treatments. And we have a lot of health issues that are rampant. But the whole idea in this, this whole global um, environment is we wanna make sure that what they're doing in the tea industry is environmentally sound and sustainable. Is it socially equitable? Are people getting a living wage? Are they being treated fairly as the health conditions up? But at the same time, it must be economically feasible because if you can't do, you cannot produce a tea that can be paid for um, these efforts, um, the whole thing will collapse. So they're really, it's really str struggling to find that sweet spot where social equity um, 
financial gain and um, the environment, uh, sustainable or, or even regeneration of the environment um, can be um, produced. We have supply chain um, conversations. Um, even the, the Evergreen ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal created ripples for, for years uh, through the, the tea producing um, areas. Um, you don't think it's just not just the tea, but also the tea bags, the, um, the, the equipment that goes with it, um, but also the distribution channels, where you go through the processing, who plucks, who processes, who uh, distributes it. Um, you have tea companies that have never seen um, a field and you have some companies that are all, all from field all the way to the consumer. But that also has a lot of QA regulatory requirements. Global food safety is a, a critical key. Um, all of these companies have to follow rigorous HACCP plans and they have to know what that is and that they can be trusted. So each step in the way has a very rigorous um, corrective testing uh, process so that what becomes to the consumer is wholesome to consume. Uh, we do um, economics and marketing. We have value added to tea. Um, tea isn't just uh, bulk tea that goes into a teapot. It can also be put into tea bags. There are different types of tea bags for the consumer. Um, they also have um, uh, orange. Um, um, you can have decaf tea. There's a, a regular tea that has been decaffeinated. You can have um, tea that is aged and fermented like puer, so shown in the middle, um, but even just changing the container and how it's shipped and the, and the story that goes with it, like in Harney's um, Imperial Tea, is a value added to just simply bulk tea. Tea has gone um, crazy with being added into mints and ice cream and into other products just because of the health um, benefits um, associated with tea con consumption. But even things like um, uh, pr tea producers in Kenya that have very little access to markets, but if they can, um, if the small producers there can extract the tea components into a freeze dried a granule, then they can sell it around the world at a much more um, a cost effective method um, level and be able to support tea producers in all across the globe. Um, we finally ended up with the tea health. Um, I, I wanted to show the, the, the what's in the green tea leaves because where you grow it changes the uh, components and the levels of each of these, how you process it, highlights and and uh, changes subtly some of these um, chemistries that are really health giving. Uh, Dr. Milosevic, um, who is going to be one of the present presenters in the colloquium that um, Catherine mentioned before, gave a great talk um, over um, what the health benefits um, in all sorts of pa um, parts of the body and even some of the issues that may come up with it. So overall, what's next? Um, well, what's next is we need to expand this curriculum. They got ray of reviews from the, um, from the companies that sent their students to the program, uh, but we need to raise it to a very much higher academic standard. Um, each one of those talks that were given could actually be an entire course on their own, um, but we're gonna ramp it up to a, a, a program that has four courses. It's gonna be, it'll take over a year to go through the program. It's gonna take about 10 hours per week of work for the for these people to get through the program, which is very difficult to do, but working professionals will get a lot out of this program, and it has a vigorous um, UC Davis academic credit to it, and hopefully this will raise the tea industry and the visibility of UC Davis GTI to the same level the wine department has and the brewing department has on campus, um, and bringing together uh, disparate people from across campus um, to share in the Global Tea Initiative's success. Thank you. I want to thank our speakers for sharing how their unique roles contribute to work of the Global Tea Initiative and the fascinating world of tea. I have learned so much today about tea, the tea that I drink you know, every morning. So uh, now onto the questions and answers segment. I'm sure many of you can wait to ask our presenters. We received a plethora of questions that were submitted. 
And so we're going to dive into them first. And then with time permitting, we'll also look at the questions via the Q&A box. So onto our first question. And this is for Dr. Burnett and Dr. Hay. When did you get involved in this research and what inspired you? And I'm going to ask Dr. Burnett to answer first. So we did receive a lot of questions, so I'm going to ask that you please keep your answers short so we can get through as many questions as possible. Thank you. I, I love that question. And of course, we all like to talk about our research. So thanks for asking it. Um, so for me, it came through teapots. Um, I was researching um, uh, the importance of the paradigmatic value of originality, conceptual originality in the 17th century of China, and happened to notice in my course of research that uh, one of the most important theorists of the day was also having conversations with a potter. And um, suddenly the light bulbs went off in my head and I went, oh my God, this is why teapots, let's see if I can find one, teapots that were about this size, I'm trying to get it <laughs> past my screen so you can see it. We went from this size to this size um, in that time. And so I was very curious and, and about that and I, and I wanted to uh, explain what happened. And coincidentally, I will say that this also is the beginning of GTI. Um, right at, as I was thinking about that, I chanced to have a lunch with um, one of our major wonderful librarians, and we love our librarians, and a local collector of Japanese art who also is a food and wine world-renowned expert. And in the middle of lunch, where I had brought a bunch of my little tiny teapots, he picked one up and said, where'd these come from? Uh, he can be sometimes a little gruff. And I explained, and he said, well, Catherine, what I don't understand is, why doesn't UC Davis study tea? And I went, oh my God. UC Davis should study tea. UC Davis can study tea. I had just been appointed to the head of the East Asian Studies program and the campus had just announced a, a unique grant opportunity to bring the sciences together with the uh, arts and, and humanities. And so um, we put together the all things tea research cluster uh, in 2012 and then three years later, um, it enough momentum had uh, been gained, and we uh, initiated the Global Tea Initiative for the Study of Tea Culture and Science. Thank you. For me, the, uh, the inspiration was really seeing that tea farm for the first time and seeing the similarities to California. Um, that's what initiated it all. But today, I'm really most inspired by my students to see them get so excited about the research. And I really see um, how they're able to, you know, um, just really internalize the science uh, of, the, of, of tea. And I have to say the farmers, I've gotten to meet a lot of farmers in uh, across the world, throughout the world. Uh, growing tea. And it is a really, um, it's not an easy thing to do, uh, but it's highly rewarding. And those people really inspire me. I'd love to make their job easier. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Brown. How does the U.S. consumer market differ from other international markets when it comes to tea consumption? Um, yeah, it's always an interesting question and we're actually GTI is trying to change that consumption rule. Um, US is about uh, 35th in uh, per capita uh, consumption of tea. Uh, you might be surprised Turkey's number one at almost seven pounds per person per year. Um, can compare that to about half a pound of consumption for the US. Um, compare that to coffee, we're about 19th and it's about 10 pounds per person a year consumption of, of coffee. Um, that statistic and the ranking of 34th is actually might be a little bit more um, falsely um, inflated, strictly because a lot of the tea U.S. drinks is in iced tea. And with the ubiquitous uh, free refills, a lot of tea is left unconsumed on kitchen, uh, on restaurant tables. Um, and so it may be a little less than that. But there has been a resurgence in tea consumption in the U.S. just because of COVID. Um, being able to uh, elevate that very calming 
tea consumption. Um, so it's it, while it may be a lower than most countries, um, it is um, elevating. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And the next question is again for Dr. Burnett. How did tea manage to invade disparate civilizations and societies? Um, also a fun question. So one of the interesting things to realize about tea is that it has always been a cash crop. And one of the things that's interesting about that is that people trade goods, uh, barter system or through paying with some kind of cash or, um, and people are always looking for opportunities um, and to, for exchange. And so um, tea was first grown um, in China in the Southwest um, of China and then spread uh, over time to what I call the tea belt um, uh, Northwest India across to south, Southern China. And then by the Tang Dynasty in the say seventh century, it, it had spread, well, actually earlier than that, it had spread North through all of China. And so through trade routes um, across from China West to Tibet and then Russia and points West, further West um, and merit, uh, early on in the Tang Dynasty and um, later on, uh, especially in the 16th, 16th, 17th centuries through global maritime routes, um, tea has spread due to demand. People liked it and imported it and wanted more of it. And um, so it's, it's just a fascinated, fascinating story um, I, to really explain it fully, it would take me, you know, an hour, but that's just the beginning and I'd be happy to talk with you further. Thank you for that answer. The next question is to Dr. Hay. How is the global tea industry supporting research? The global tea industry um, How are there's, they actually, many of them have their own research enterprises. So they have their uh, own research institutes. Uh, for example, Japan has their research institution. I, I'm familiar with ones in Shizuoka. Also Taiwan has a tea uh, research institute. They uh, teach courses to, um, to potential growers and processors of tea. Uh, in Taiwan, for sure, I know that to be the case. Uh, and they're partnering, many of them are partnering, uh, some of these international institutes of research are actually partnering, partnering with UC Davis in hopes of attracting students uh, in exchange, having exchange students uh, to encourage them to pursue careers in the, in the tea industry. You. And the next question is for uh, Dr. Brown. How has the pandemic and climate change affected tea production and supply? Um, yeah, like I mentioned before, uh, with the pandemic, there's been an uh, increase in tea consumption because it's soothing effect and the health effects. Uh, but it really has had a dramatic effect all across the, the world. I mean, timing is everything. The When it was called the pandemic in March uh, of 2020, that's exactly when the first harvest, the first pluck was going through. Um, and it really affected production around the world. Um, China had um, didn't see much change. Uh, they had a slight reduction in consumption, which went with a slight uh, reduction in uh, um, con consumption. But in India, it had a devastating effect. In Darjeeling, um, they put a complete um, shutdown, um, which devastated the, the, the Darjeeling harvest for that year. Um, a lot of workers um, in Darjeeling come from um, work in the hospitality industry across the, the, the nation of in India and, and come back to India to harvest. And a lot of them were afraid they were going to bring back the virus, so they shut that down. Um, in Assam, it wasn't too bad because it, their second uh, flush is what um, is the main event for harvesting uh, tea in that area. But they, um, they had a lot of issues with um, tea production. Um, combine that with a, a typhoon that went through um, the southern end of India, devastating uh, their tea, tea in that region. Um, and then think about the three million people that were evacuated because of flooding of the monsoons that came afterwards and the spread of COVID there, um, that was a huge 
blow to the Indian um, tea industry. At the same time, um, in, in Africa, in Kenya, um, they were um, sitting on a glut of Kenyan tea that no one was paying for. But all of a sudden, with the loss of Indian tea, um, uh, they really had a, um, a big boon in their market. So they actually benefited from COVID um, going through that area. Um, Sri Lanka, a very important tea region, uh, they deemed tea production to be essential. And so they kept everybody going and it had a devastating spread of COVID in that country, um, hurting the population, um, not so much the tea industry, but the, uh, the personnel. Um, I mean, things like Turkey, which gets a lot of their tea workers from uh, neighboring countries uh, that do the harvesting. Well, they shut down the borders in March and they did not allow any harvesters to come in. Um, so that devastated, um, the production um, in Turkey, and Turkey being the number one consumer, they needed a lot of, of tea coming in. So uh, Sri Lanka got to um, pick up that gap and their, their value went up. Um, I think one of the most interesting things is Argentina, which did not have a lot of impact on their production because uh, it's pretty much automated, automated uh, production of, of, of tea. And the number one um, channel of distribution is about 80% into the US, um, especially in the iced tea market. Um, so they were sitting pretty until you realized that all of the restaurants where most of the iced tea is served were shut down and they lost 80% of their markets to COVID. So both the COVID and the environmental um, stresses that have been going on have really had a mixed bag, um, whether it's health of the, the workers or the marketing of the, the product. Thank you for that fascinating answer. So the next question is, um, um, Dr. Hay, are the claims that green tea and white tea contain less caffeine than black tea true? If so, what are the contributing factors? The con contributing uh, factors to caffeine in tea are numerous. They come, it can be the variety of the tea used, the way that the tea was processed, the stress that the tea felt um, during growth. The only way to really know the relative amounts of caffeine in a cup of tea is to measure it in that cup of tea because how long you steep the tea will affect how much caffeine is in the tea. The temperature of the water that you use to steep the tea will affect uh, the, the amount of caffeine as well. So it's, it's a simple question, but actually difficult to answer um, without directly measuring the amount of caffeine in the cup. So it's not necessarily directed to the type of tea. It would depend on so many factors as to how that um, cup of tea was prepared. Thank you for that answer. So next question is for Dr. Burnett. Should all teas steep at the same temperature, water, and if yes, what degree would that be? <laughs> that is, again, a good question and, again, a little bit complicated. So depending on the kind of tea you have um, will require a different temperature and length of time for the steep. So um, green tea being green tea and white tea being the um, lowest temperature, usually you want to steep that between 175 to around 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a real special green tea, you might even go as low as 165. Of course, there's cold brew, but that's something else. Um, oolong teas that you want to steep at 195 degrees. Black teas and dark teas uh, around 212. So around boiling, maybe a little bit lower, uh, 205 to 212. Um, but then you also want to think about the amount of time of steeping. So for a tea bag tea, you know, you can follow instructions and see, do what it says. But if you have a really high grade loose leaf tea, um, you need to steep it for just maybe 15 seconds or 30 seconds or a couple minutes. So um, I just made a cup of uh, some green tea uh, for my family and I it was ready after 15 seconds. So for those kinds of teas, I steep and I let it sit for 15 seconds and then around 30 seconds and taste and taste and taste until it tastes just right. When it tastes just right to me, 
I'm happy. So then it's done. Um, but then you have to do something else. And this is, alludes to something that Jackie was saying. If you leave the liquid or liquor on the leaves uh, long term, then it will increase the amount of tannins and caffeine in your cup. So what people who know tea do is they pour off the beverage, the liquid into a second vessel or a large cup and drink it from there. Um, and so then, then, um, then you can really enjoy it. Well, thank you. We have way more questions than we can answer. So I'm gonna have a last question. However, I'm gonna ask our panelists to please look in the Q&A and answer some questions from our guests that we are unable to answer live. But the last question is for Dr. Burnett. What does the future look like for the Global Tea Initiative and are there tangible ways to support? Oh, another great question. So um, yeah, the future looks rosy um, and indeed, um, and uh, it, it, people are writing to me all the time from around the world, asking if they can come to Davis to study um, as uh, scholars and as students. Um, and so, you know, as we build up our curriculum, um, that will, will make it more and more possible for our students. But to enhance that and to ensure the GTI has longevity, um, what we need to do is um, build uh, infrastructure. And that means, you know, things that would be wonderful to, for support would be endowed professorships uh, across the various co colleges and schools to ensure that there's some expert always teaching about tea. Um, it would be wonderful to um, uh, give funds for enhancing um, curriculum development, um, for prizes for student research, for uh, to support research of faculty in specific projects um, to uh, sponsor our events and um, and uh, donate funds for um, uh, an endowed directorship um, and also uh, the opportunity to name our institute and help us build our building. All of those things are possible. And if you have ideas, we'd love to talk with you. That is great. And I think onto that note as well, maybe Dr. Brown can answer this question. Um, you talked about a professional program. Is that going to be online? Because those are some questions from the Q and A. Would it be online? Yeah, the the primarily um, it will be focused online just because of the global uh, uh, program and uh, how we're going to reach people. And for working professionals, uh, they assimilate online education very well. But I think that it would be really um, adapted well to join, um, to have people come to Davis for the colloquium when they start back in person so that it ties it all together to see the research that's on campus and meet the professors and people that are part of it. But primarily, we'll be online certificate. So thank you very much to our panelists. And I also want to say thank you to our guest uh, for all of your thoughtful questions. Unfortunately, we had way more questions than we could answer. Uh, given the time that was allotted to us. However, you should now see a poll on your screen. Please take a minute to answer uh, the poll. Thank you. So while you're answering the poll, let me take a moment to thank our speakers again for taking the time to share how the Global Tea Initiative is bringing innovation and attention to the multi-billion dollar tea industry. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us today and for your philanthropic support. As the chancellor highlighted in his video, this initiative is a perfect example of how UC Davis utilizes an interdisciplinary approach to bring attention to global culture and science. Whatever your passion may be, there is a way you can help support it. If you're interested in giving to the Global Tea Initiative, you can contact Charlene Madison, Assistant Dean of the College of Letters and Science. We hope you are all staying healthy and safe, and we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Goodbye.